All right, so in this lecture, I want to say just a little bit about evaluating premises, you know, deciding whether premises are good or not, whether we should accept them or not, right? Because remember, for an argument to work, deductive argument, which is what we're talking about, the, you know, the argument's form has to be valid, but we also need true premises, right? You know, valid argument doesn't really prove that much because on top of an argument being valid you also need for the premises to be true for the argument to be a good one. So how do we evaluate premises? Good premises should be true. They should also not just be premises you personally think are true not or even premises that you personally are really sure are true, right? They should also be ones that your reader or listener will agree is true. And since a lot of times you don't know who your reader or listener might be, or because you know you want to try to convince as many people as possible, your premises should not be controversial. And by that I mean, you know, you are pretty sure they are true you are very confident they are true and you also think that a random person taken off the street would also admit your premises are true. Alright, so we'll talk a bit more about what makes a premise controversial in a second. So let me say though, before we get to that, obviously you will sometimes need to use premises that are not obviously true or premises that are just very controversial. You might think they're true, but you might think that there's a good chance somebody taking it random would reject it or even that most people taking it random would reject it. In that case, your statement is controversial. And if you make a controversial statement in an argument, you need to give some proof, right? When you look at arguments, you know, you'll sometimes see a lot of sub-arguments. That's one way of giving evidence. You know, you make an argument for a premise, then that premise forms part of another argument, right? You can also sometimes cite evidence, right? You know, talk more about what good evidence looks like. But first, let's just talk a bit about what arguments are and aren't controversial. You know. Vaughn doesn't talk about this, which is why I have you guys read the little bit from Lavin. Lavin does talk about this, and I think he does. I'd like to see him say more. One of these days when I have time, I will probably write a little piece myself to use for class where I say a lot more. But, you know, he does a pretty good job, right? You know, you can almost give a little bar graph that most people would agree to about how controversial a statement is. And if a statement isn't controversial at all, if it's common knowledge, if it's widely agreed, you know, you don't need evidence or an argument for it. Hitler was a bad person, right? You don't need an argument for that claim. Everybody knows that, right? Murder is wrong, right? You don't need an argument for that claim. Again, everybody knows that. Washington, D.C. is the capital of the U.S. Common knowledge, right? the earth is round. Now look, you know this last one, I will say, when you say the average person will agree, I mean look, there is no statement that you're not going to find some weird crazy person who disagrees with, right? You're going to find some horrible, horrible people who think Hitler was just fine and dandy, right? God help, I've had a student or two who thought that, yeah, the less said about that the better, right? you know, sky is blue, I guess, I don't know, everybody agrees on that one, I guess, maybe somebody wouldn't write, but, you know, there are flat earthers, there are people who don't think murder is wrong, again, God help us all, there are people who think Hitler was fine and dandy, but the point being, you know, an average person on the street, you wouldn't expect to say, oh, the earth is flat, or Hitler's, Hitler's just, you know, he's, he gets a bad rap, but... No, right? Common knowledge, most everybody will agree. 
In fact, most sane people will agree. You can even use your argument. Not agreeing with this is a good judgment. This person is not really, you know, all together on things, right? Here's some arguments or some statements that do need a proof for an argument, right? They're not common knowledge and they're much more controversial, right? George Jones wasn't a very nice person, right? Look, a lot of y'all probably don't even know who George Jones was. He was a country singer. Um, even if you do, a lot of people, I mean, I like his songs, right? But he's a terrible guy. You know, like a lot of people think he's okay, but you know. Point being, not everybody knows this. Even people who know who he is might disagree. You would. I don't know why you'd be making an argument about George Jones in our class, but if you were, you'd need to give some proof, some evidence to back up this claim that he was not a very nice person. I mean, he beat up his wife, he beat up his girlfriend, he shot guns at lots of people, including one of his wives and one of his best friends, he was a terrible shot and always missed. You know, I, I think those are pretty good arguments he wasn't super nice, right? But you need to give evidence like that to back up a claim like this. People should be allowed to sell their organs. I don't know. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not. But it's not the kind of thing you could go on the street and say to any random person, hey, do you think people should be able to sell their kidneys for money? Some people might disagree with you, some people might not. It is more controversial. It's not an obvious claim, right? The ancient Greeks had no word for blue. Look, maybe that's true, maybe it's not. I actually think it is true, but it's not common knowledge. You would need to give some evidence and proof for it. Knoxville, Tennessee is a nice place to live. I mean, that's not super controversial. Unlike, you know, the people should be allowed to sell organs when people probably don't have strong feelings on this. But it's not common knowledge either. You would have to give some evidence for it. Albuterol is not an effective treatment for bronchiolitis in babies. My pediatrician told us. Unfortunately, our son had bronchiolitis for a bit. You know, right? That's not common knowledge. A lot of you probably don't know what albuterol is or bronchiolitis is. And it's also, it turns out, a little controversial. Some physicians actually prescribe this. There's research saying it isn't super effective for most babies, though, right? So any of these statements, the very least, they're not common knowledge. And a lot of them would be controversial. A lot of them would be like, a lot of people would be like, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not, right? But some of them, like, you know, the organs would especially, a lot of people would disagree. You would need to give some proof. Now, this leads to a concept that's very important. And again, Vaughn doesn't talk about this. Lavin does, which is why I gave you guys the Lavin, which is the burden of proof. To say that someone has the burden of proof means that they're the person who has to make their case. You know, when someone makes a statement, if you tell me the earth is flat and I say, no, 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 the earth is round, which of us has to make our case, right? You know, right, it would be the person who says the earth's flat, right? He needs to give some evidence. If we both, you know, if we both can just give a little bit of evidence and it's kind of a tie, it's not like, well, we just don't know whether the other's round or flat, right? He has the burden of proof. He needs to make it, right? And for a lot of statements, be they premises and arguments or the conclusions of argument, one person will clearly have the burden of proof and they need to make that burden of proof or we just shouldn't accept the claim, right? And we can talk about burden of proof being higher or lower, and that means that someone must do more or less to make the case, right? And a good example of this is a criminal trial. In a criminal trial, the prosecution has the burden of proof. You know, if the prosecution doesn't make a case that the person's guilty, but the defense doesn't make a good case that they're innocent, it's not like, well, we flip a coin because we don't just don't know. We let the person go because the prosecution is the side that needs to make their case. And 
the burden of proof in a criminal trial is a very high one beyond a reasonable doubt you know I remember you know watching crime shows with my dad he loves these and you know he'd say well the jury's got to convict this guy you know and I'd be like well I don't think I would if I were on the jury and he'd be like well, well don't you think he's guilty and I'd be like yeah I think he probably is he's like well how would you not convict right and I'd be like well look the burden of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt I think there's a 55% chance this guy's guilty maybe right if you press me for a number 55% though it does mean I think yes he probably is guilty it's more likely than not that he's guilty but for me at least 55% is not beyond a reasonable doubt you know I wouldn't walk onto a bridge if I thought there was a 45% chance it would collapse and I would fall into a pit I have reasonable doubts about that bridge you know 45% chance that this guy's innocent is a reasonable doubt even if the prosecution I think made a decent case and I'm like okay 55% chance you're guilty they don't make their burden of proof because it's much higher than that now I, I don't know what the percentage chance for beyond a reasonable doubt is I just think it's probably higher than 55% for me it's probably higher than 95% you know maybe even higher than that this is one of the reasons that prosecuting attorneys never never ever want philosophers on juries because we want a lot of proof apparently they hate mathematicians even more because mathematicians want even more proof but we are not a popular party you know I, I know this from some experience and experience friends of mine have had when the prosecutor hears what you do for a living it's like alright yeah get rid of that guy Yeah, we don't want him alright so anyway, if the person who has the burden of proof doesn't make it, we should usually reject the claim. Figuring out who has the burden of proof and what it is is important for evaluating both the premises and the conclusions in any argument. How you know, should we accept the premises or not? How much evidence do we need before we accept the premises? And how good does the argument need to be to pre convince us of the conclusion? So, proving or supporting non-moral claims slash premises. Well, the first thing you can do is to use sources, right? And use reputable sources. You know, think about our death penalty argument we talked about last lecture. The death penalty doesn't prevent crime. Well, how would we support a claim like that? That's definitely a controversial claim. A lot of people think it does prevent crime. That is a claim that needs some more support before we could bring it out in an argument, right? Well, we can look at sources, right? There are studies on this. You know, two states right next to each other one has the death penalty, one doesn't, which has a lower crime rate. You know, states that got rid of the death penalty, does the crime rate go up or down? You know, lots of sites out there will keep figures on this and, you know, find those sites, use sources, right? But use reputable sources, you know you need to know you know if you see studies about the death penalty in some random dude's blog and he doesn't give a source for them I don't know that you should trust it right if it's in say the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal that's more trustworthy right and now here's another thing for the more the more controversial a claim is the more there's need to use multiple reputable sources right you know one person might be they might be a reputable source but they might focus on the claims that show the death penalty isn't effective you know check multiple sources see if there's something they're leaving out for especially controversial claims it helps to consult multiple sources with different political views backgrounds or agendas 
you know, look, different newspapers, different TV channels, even different experts have different political slants, right? If they all agree on something, though, if, if the Republican, the Democrat, and the centrist all agree on something, that's a pretty good chance that's true, right? That's really powerful evidence for it, right? You know, New York Times is a pretty liberal paper. Wall Street Journal is a moderately conservative one. You know, I think U.S. A Today is a centrist one. If you were looking at some news story and you want to know, well, did X really happen the way they said it did? You know, if the New York Times, Wall Street Journal... And USA Today all say, yeah, it happened that way. That's really good evidence, right? You have multiple sources from different perspectives, different agendas, right? You should also consult experts or authorities when appropriate. And, you know, again, it helps here if you would consult experts or authorities with different political views or agendas, right? And now one thing you want to be careful about is how to make a legitimate argument from authority. You know, when you make an argument from authority, it has to meet three conditions. There have to be widely recognized authorities on the subject, person must actually be one of those authorities, and the authorities on the issue must agree on the specific issue, right? You know, think of it this way, right? Do you want... Think, about, think if you want to know whether smoking is bad, right? I mean, we all know smoking is bad now, but, you know, let's imagine you were one of those people in the early 70s, late 60s who's like, I don't know about smoking, you know, it's like, it's, they're saying some stuff about it. If you go to your doctor, well, are there widely recognized authorities on questions of health? Yes, we call them doctors, you know, they have certificates on the wall, their medical license, their diploma, is this person one of these authorities? Well, if they have that on the wall, yes, they are. Do the authorities agree on this specific issue? Yes, they do. They all will tell you smoking is bad for you, right? Except for a few cranks. The same goes, you know, more modern times you might say, well, what about, should I give my, should I get my kid, like, you know, immunized, right? What about vaccines? There are experts on this subject, you know, pediatricians. Again, they're wild, widely recognized. They have all this stuff on their wall. They have licenses. Is the person you're talking to an authority? If they are able to set up shop as a pediatrician and no one shut them down and they have all the stuff on their wall, yes, they're an authority. Do the authorities agree on this issue? Yes, they do. You can ask 10 pediatricians. They will all tell you to get your kids their vaccines, right? Now, there has to be agreement here because we don't want to cherry pick, right? You know, on any controversial issue, you can probably find an authority who disagrees with you, but that's very meaningless if, let's say, half the authorities agree with you and half disagree, right? So it has to be a question where the authorities actually agree. Now here's a question I want you guys to think about, and we'll talk about it in class, but I want you to think about it because I think it's important. Arguments from authority are often very good ways to support factual claims, very good ways to support our non-moral premises. Arguments from authority are not, generally speaking, good ways to support moral premises. Why is that? You know. Why is it the case which of these three conditions, maybe there's more than one, but which of these, at least one, maybe more than one, which of these do arguments from authority about moral claims generally fail? Let me give you guys a specific example. Let's say I told you, well, the Dalai Lama says we should all be vegetarians. I think he has said that. I'm not. I'm not sure. Right? Pretty sure he said something to that effect. Um, but let's just imagine he had. Right? Why is that not enough support for this claim that we should all be vegetarians? Which of these conditions does it fail? Or, or, or let's take another one. Right? The Pope says abortion is wrong. 
why does that argument from authority which of these conditions does it fail to satisfy and more generally which conditions do arguments for moral premises or moral claims based on arguments from authority fail to satisfy okay then so we've said a bit about non-moral premises how do we evaluate moral premises and come up with good ones well that will be the subject of the course right we're gonna do that throughout the whole semester so we're not gonna settle this question in this lecture right it's gonna be what we do for the next few weeks but I want to say one thing because you know Vaughn talks about this briefly and I think this is super important so I want to emphasize it a bit more one mark of a good moral principle is that it's not liable to an obvious counterexample or reductio argument. We'll talk about what these are in a second, but if you want to test a moral principle, see if you can think of these counterexamples or reductios, you know. If you want to formulate a good one, try to avoid these, right? So what are they? Counterexamples and reductios are, are basically the same kind of thing. Reductio is just a more developed more explicit version of this. A reductio ad absurdum, which is what reductio is short for, is a kind of argument. Arguments of this sort show that we must reject a principle or claim because if it were true, then we would have to accept another claim that we know to be false. Reductio arguments rely on modus tollens. Remember, modus tollens is if A then B, not B, so not A. Well, we want to show if A is true, then this other thing B that we know is false is also true. Since B can't be true, we have to reject A. That's how the reductio argument works. Let me give you guys a few examples of reductio arguments, just developing them out. Doctors should always do whatever saves the most lives on balance. This is a moral principle, right? Well, here's a reductio argument of that principle. Suppose a doctor could save the lives of five people on the organ donation list by secretly killing one homeless addict in his care, right? You know, he kills this addict, you know, cuts him up for his, you know, guy's an organ donor, kills him we get five organs you know we get you know two lungs a liver two kidneys wait is that more than five wait so two lungs liver three two kidneys five actually you could probably get a few more organs out of it let's not get into that though right the point being if doctors should always do whatever saves the most lives on balance then the doctor should kill the homeless addict the doctor should not kill the homeless addict, right? Doctors should not murder people. They especially should not murder vulnerable patients. If it is true that doctors should always do anything that saves the most lives on balance, then doctors should kill a homeless addict when they can do it to get his organs. It's very clear to us doctors shouldn't do that. That would be an evil, horrible thing for a doctor to do. So we have to reject this principle that doctors should do whatever saves the most lives on balance. Here's another one. It is always wrong to lie. Well, suppose that the Nazis asked someone who was hiding Jews in her house if she were hiding anyone in her house. If it were always wrong to lie, then it would be morally wrong for her to say no, right? She shouldn't say no. She should be like, well, actually, yes, I'm hiding these Jews. They're in the cellar. You got me. But of course, it's ridiculous to say that it's morally wrong for her to say no. She should say no, no, goodness, no, I would, I would never do that. You know, the blah, blah, blah. She should try to pretend to be a good Nazi, right? I'm not going to say Nazi things, but she should mouth whatever crap these guys want to hear right lie through her teeth and do it as well as she can it would not be morally wrong to say no to answer the nazis question untruthfully so it is not always wrong to lie 
If it were always wrong to lie, you would have to tell the truth to a Nazi, even if it would get you and the people you were hiding killed. No one thinks that's the right thing to do. Not only can you acceptably lie to the Nazis, you should. All right. So we'll talk more about these reductio arguments. Um, they're a good way to show that a moral claim that we should reject it, right? Um, now look, it's not always going to be so clear as these examples. There are, and we'll talk a lot more about this, there are three things you can do when your moral principle runs into a reductio argument. You can reject your moral principle you can rework your moral principle to try to avoid it or you can bite the bullet and just say well no you know this this thing that you think is ridiculous actually isn't right um, it's interesting with this lying example right you know when we get to Kant he actually you know somebody throws out this reductio argument to Kant you know, the Nazis hadn't come to power yet. This was way before that. And they said, well, you know, you'd have to tell the truth to a murderer at the door from your moral theory, Kant. And I don't think Kant actually does, right? I actually think you can formulate some moral principle, right? Like, it is, all, it is wrong to lie unless doing so is necessary to defend yourself or others from the evil actions of other people, right? Someone puts you in a position where you have to lie to defend yourself or others, I think you can lie, right? And if that were your principle, it's wrong except when it's necessary to lie, it's wrong to lie except when it's necessary to do so to defend yourself or others, you don't get this reductio because in this case you need to lie to defend yourself and the people you're hiding from the Nazis, right? Kant bites the bullet, Kant says yes it's always wrong to lie, I, I think that's a crazy response, but we'll talk about that later, right? So, anyway, reductio arguments supposed to get you to reject the moral principle or to reject whatever principle. Three different responses. You can reject the principle, you can refine it to avoid it, or you can do what philosophers call bite the bullet and just say, well, no, no, I accept this crazy response. You know, we're going to do that. We'll talk a lot more about that. That'll be important going forward. Just know that that is one possible. Those are the responses to this.